World Financial Group offers entrepreneurs from all backgrounds the opportunity to start their own business on a level playing field. Dr. Yana Woodhouse, receiving the WCM Wall Street Pioneer Award by the United Black Wall Street of America, Inc., is one of those entrepreneurs. I see WFG and TFA as a place where African Americans with an entrepreneurial mindset can flourish. And the bonus, we help families and serve the communities across the country. To learn more about us, go to worldfinancialgroup.com. We are the sons and daughters of the soul. We are resilient and forever forward thinking. We ask for nothing else than the opportunity to live and to create the lives that we were meant to live. We want nothing but an equal chance at options and possibilities. The same possibilities and options to live out our potential as our fellow man. We want to be heard, understood, and expressive in our reality. We are the teacher. We are the creative. We are here. and you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers, on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. Good afternoon. This is Tony Rogers, your host for Urbanology, The Art of War. I hope all is well with everyone. Uh, it's, uh, wow, it's hard to believe, but uh, we are in April. I hope many of you did not get fooled yesterday during April Fool's Day, but uh, nevertheless, um, pretty soon it'll be warm. Pretty soon it will be summer. And for the last 50 years, uh, 49 years, soon to be 50 years, during the summer, we always, through the Chamber and Harlem Week and many other organizations that I've been involved with, we prepared for Harlem Week, which uh, and Harlem Day this year would be uh, 50 years old. So it's been an interesting journey. And one of the things that I've tried to do is to bring on a number of people who uh, have been part of my journey in all of this. And and I kind of see it as a way of creating uh, a, a document of uh, the things that have happened over the past 50, maybe 60 years of, of working uh, in uh, some way, helping uh, the most well-known community in, in the world, Harlem. And today, um, I have the honor of uh, having a brother that I've known for, for many years. I, I, I want to do him service, so I'm going to try to introduce him by reading uh, a brief. And he had to be brief because James has done so much that uh, it would take another show just to read his, his bio. But nevertheless, I'm going to attempt to do this, James, and I, I, I hope that I, I, I give you justice, my brother, but I want people to know who you are and what you've done. James H. Harding, Jr. is a former commissioner, member of the Board of Directors of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. 
the biggest transportation agency in North America. In this role, Harding served as the chair and had board oversight on all diversity issues within the MTA. He also served as chair of safety and security in the aftermath of 9-11. Harding's career spans over 39 years in key uh, management positions in New York City and New York State government, including Director of Legislative Affairs for uh, the Governor of the State of New York, Governor Pataki. He also served as the Chair of the New York State Dr. Martin Luther King Holiday Commission, which allowed for us to have a legal holiday. In 1985, Jim was appointed Special Advisor to the police commissioner of the technical narcotics uh, team, TNT. Harding served as deputy commissioner of the New York City Fire Department and director of the, the advance for the mayor of the city of New York. Harding worked for the first lady of the United States uh, Rosalind Carter as part of her advanced staff traveling throughout the United States. Um, Dr. Harding received an honorary degree from the City University of New York where he uh, has lectured and is an adjunct professor. His current position um, is the Assistant Commissioner uh, Senior Advisor to External Partnerships the Office of the Fire Commissioner. Uh, I wanted to read that because uh, we've known each other for a long period of time, but uh, it's always interesting to be able to record the, the, the people who have done so much. Uh, what I know as it relates to the Chamber and Harlem Week is that there was a time when you saw Jim you knew that either the mayor was coming or, or the governor was coming or somebody important because he was always the first person there that usually I would be. So please welcome um, a good friend, uh, Jim Harding, who will discuss a number of things, but important, one of the important things, we have a through the chamber a, a, a monthly leaders call and, and, and Mr. Harding was on it and he, uh, talked about some issues that uh, I'm going to do my best to help him uh, make sure that we all are aware of some of the fire safety issues that are there and also opportunities. So, Mr. Hardy, how are you doing, my brother? Tony, we've had a long journey together. And I know <laughs> that you read my bio, but your bio is just as extensive. And I'm proud to be here with you this afternoon to talk to your listeners and to talk about some of the critical things that are taking place in New York City. Well, so um, you. again, Jim, you've been uh, in all of the different areas that one might be able to think that you should be in, in the politics of New York City and New York State and, and in the MTA. So please uh, talk to us about whatever you think is important. But of course, we want to talk about uh, the fire safety, some of the issues that have taken place, some of the things that we talked on the, the leadership call that takes place every every month with people in the, in, in the Harlem area. Sure, but before I do that, I want to thank you for your service to the Harlem community. And I want to thank uh, Lloyd Williams, who's the president and CEO of the Great Harlem Chamber of Commerce. And I look at it like this, Tony, when the team wins, we all win. And we've been a winning team for 40 years. And uh, what we've done for the Harlem community is irreplaceable. And I want to congratulate you, the board members of uh, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, Lloyd Williams, and all the others uh, that have made Harlem what it is today. Harlem is a fascinating community. And when you, in my opinion, we've done great. And we've really done well. Come a long way. <laughs> A very long way. So 50 uh, years, 1974 is going to be uh, an interesting summer uh, as we recoup. But that's why I wanted to have people like yourself on, because in 1974, we we started the day as the beginning of the second Harlem Renaissance. 
and people like yourself will be uh, looked upon as those individuals that actually uh, shepherd the second Harlem Renaissance into where it was, where it is, and where it will be. Well, so, that's very kind, and I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward uh, to this summer, another uh, great Harlem Week uh, that will take place for 2024 and the 50th anniversary. Uh, but Tony, with, like you said, on the leaders' call of the day, the day, I spoke about a few things, and I just wanted your views to know a few things. It's very, very important uh, that all people throughout the city, the Harlem community, every community of New York, has a working smoke detector. Uh, there have been a number of fires throughout the city, um, and you'd be surprised how many times that we find that there are no smoke detectors. And if you have a smoke detector, it's just very, very important for you to check the batteries to make sure that they're working. The batteries have to be checked on a regular basis. Also, if you don't have a working smoke detector, the fire department has run a program uh, with the Red Cross and the New York City Fire Foundation where we can install smoke detectors for free. And I just wanna share a phone number with you and your audience uh, that if you don't have a working smoke detector, if you're elderly, if you're handicapped, or if you're needing one, please call 1-800-877-2767. And somebody will come out and install a working smoke detector for you. That's really- Could you really repeat important. that number, Jim? The number is 1-800-877-2767. Thank you. And that's through the Red Cross, the New York City Fire Foundation, and it's a program that was started by the New York City Fire Department. I know that there's also uh, an issue uh, with the uh, fires that have been recently throughout uh, not only Harlem, but uh, throughout the city dealing with uh, the, the electric bike batteries. Could you talk to a little bit about that and some of the issues that you see and some of the things that you, uh, through uh, your role with the fire department, are looking to, to do to address some of that? Yes. Well, Fire Commissioner Laura Kavanaugh, uh, the first woman fire commissioner in New York City, has spearheaded that effort uh, through legislators at the federal level, the city level, and the state level, trying to get legislation uh, to make sure that the batteries in the bikes are UL certified. Um, a lot of the batteries in the electric bikes are brought offline. They're brought in places that they shouldn't be brought, and they're not properly certified. So let me just explain to you what happens, Tony. Uh, we've all heard about a number of uh, uh, lithium ion battery bike fires in apartments. What happens, the bike, the battery, when you charge it, it explodes into a ball of fire, and and the number of people in New York City have died over the course of 2023. The number for 2023 was 18. So far for 2024, we've had one death up on 151st uh, Street in St. Nicholas Place. And where the fire happened at 151st in St. Nicholas Place, the individual that died was not even in the apartment where the bike was. We we're very concerned about uh, delivery drivers, uh, people that have bikes, um, them not buying proper batteries. Uh, batteries that are not UL labeled are faulty and they can cause a fire and the fire causes death and, and destruction uh, to many communities. And that's one of the things that we're concerned about. And that's why uh, the commissioner in the New York City Fire Department is trying to get legislation on all levels, the city, state and federal level to make it illegal to sell a battery other than what's UL certified. And I suppose that since many of the people who are using the bikes are working for businesses, I guess in some way uh, that legislation, the language might uh, have some sort of uh, relationship to the responsibility of the business owner who's using uh, these bicycles, because a lot of times actually it's the business owner who owns the bicycles and the, the riders are people who are working for that uh, 
uh, particular business. So I, I, you know, I, I, I would imagine that the legislation will have some sort of penalty of knowingly uh, using those types of, of vehicles. Because as you had mentioned, sometimes the explosion is in the store, which affects the entire building. So uh, I, 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 I'm saying that so that the listeners who are, are viewers who are viewing this can support. We're in the election time now, and people are asking questions of what can we do for you to get your vote. So some of these things that uh, uh, Mr. Harding is talking about, Commissioner, uh, you should bring that up because it has an effect on everyone. Yeah, we're very concerned about that. And, and we just need to try to educate the public to make them understand or the consequence of um, plugging in and trying to charge a battery that's not UL certified. Uh, the battery, it, it just doesn't catch fire. It, it explodes. Right. And if you go to the FDNY website, you can look at lithium ion battery fires. And we actually have videos online that shows uh, what a battery can do and the magnitude of the fire and the explosion it takes. I mean, you can imagine if you're sitting in a bedroom and a battery explodes. It explodes throughout the walls and throughout the entire bedroom, making it very difficult for individuals to get out of the room. Uh, the most important thing, though, if you're in a building, if you're in an apartment, if there's a fire when you get out, make sure you close the door behind you. A lot of the recent fires that we've had in the city, people come out of the apartments, they leave the doors open, and that enables the fire to spread with very disastrous results. And so we're trying to educate the public on things to do, not to do. We have a fire safety education. We actually have people that go into communities and we're willing to go and talk to community groups. Um, you know, your audience can feel free to send me an email at any time. My email is jim.harding at fdny.nyc dot gov and i will refer it to our fire safety people to have them come to your community and talk in addition to that the fire commission has been holding uh, meetings in various communities with elected officials members of congress members of the state legislature members of the new york city council to talk about what we need to do collectively as a group to try to make a difference in the quality of life for all the people in new york and we've been successful with that. One person dying, dying in a fire is too many. And we all have to be safe. And we all have to realize, don't think that it can't happen to me because it happened to them. It can happen to you the same way that it did happen to them. So we have to be uh, very careful. And, you know, there is no policy right now of taking a lithium-ion battery into an apartment and the most important thing, though, is to make sure that you take one that has a UL certified battery and not a battery that you brought online or in a store uh, that might cause fire and might cause destruction to you and your family. Jim, uh, if you have a certified battery, is there still a chance of having uh, an accident or is the basic accident issue for uncertified uh, batteries? Well, it's far less of a chance and, and probably not likely because these are batteries that have been certified. Right. Um, sometimes the uncertified batteries get tampered with. Mm -hmm. People go in there and play with the cells and, and they repack it and they restore it and they don't do it properly. Mm -hmm. That's why it's better to have a UL battery, uh, one that you know that's uh, legitimate and one that has uh, the best opportunity and not causing any harm or destruction to members of you and your family. Because I, I, I ask that because, you know, people are with scooters all over the place, not just delivery people, but, you know, all of these types of electronic devices that uh, run on batteries are, are extremely popular, especially in the summertime. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you guys have... Uh, uh, community sessions where it, it, the fire department explains certain types of safety tips. I remember during Harlem week, there was a series of uh, uh, 
educational seminars at fire stations throughout the area, which is very helpful. Well, we go to every community. We're available to go to every community. Our main um, purpose is to make sure that there are no fires that cause death and destruction. So we, we can go and educate. We're here to do that. And like I said, we do have a fire safety team that actually goes out. Like you just mentioned, Harlem, we, we go to street fairs. We bring out uh, uh, vehicles and, and we let the community get a better understanding of what the fire department does and, and the impact that fires can take. The importance of having smoke detectors. We talk about all these things on a regular basis and this is what's made a difference. We go to schools. We talk to young children. You know, one of the concerns with young children playing with matches and you know i know when we were growing up you see a match you see a fire some people thought that was exciting it's not exciting it can kill it can harm and it can devastate a family in a matter of minutes and it has happened yeah i almost did that myself i you know with the plastic soldiers i learned that if you light them you know fire will go down so it was like an army you know <laughs> Well, now you're giving away. Now you're giving away your age, Tony. But I remember. Yeah, well, you know, it's. <laughs> and I, I, I never too, forget, so, boy. Uh, um, yeah. I was in, of all places, my my parents' bedroom, and they had these uh, uh, covers, and they had these little balls on the covers, and one of the flames got to the ball, and man, I, I was able to get the fire out, but you know, the darkness was there. So I knew what was coming when my parents came home. It was, well, thank God you're thank God that you didn't do anything. I'm glad thank that God I'm still here. here. Yeah. <laughs> because when I had to explain how that happened, <laughs> there was no way to do that without saying that I was playing with matches. And yeah, man. but one of the other things, Tony, that I wanted to mention, it's very important that parents not leave their children home alone. It's not That's true. it's you know, there was a, a death up in Washington Heights. Over the last two weeks, a young two-year-old uh, happened to pass away, and um, his brother is in extreme critical condition, and the mother was placed under arrest for going out one night, leaving her three children home alone um, to go to the store. And, you know, it only takes a split second for something to happen. And, you know, when kids are left alone, you don't know what they may do or what they may not do. And you don't know the circumstances that might be in their environment that leads to disaster and, and loss of life. So we at the fire department are very concerned about that. Um, you know, this has to be tearing this mother apart, but she's been placed under arrest and um, you can't leave your kids alone. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what the reason is, you cannot leave them alone. And that you have a responsibility as a parent and you have a responsibility as a mom um, to make sure that your kids are protected at all times. So I just want to remind all your viewers that, hey, it doesn't matter what you need, what you have to have. It can wait until there's proper supervision for your children. Please don't leave them home alone. Or in cars. Or in the car or anywhere else. Yeah. Anywhere else. You have to be a great parent. And, you know, and that's all part of our education process. We are out there educating people explaining the importance of not leaving your children home alone. And like I said earlier, if you have one death, that's too many. And, and we don't want anybody to die as a result of fire. And that's why the fire department is there training, uh, giving you an understanding. And we also want to show the community how great of a job it is to be a New York City firefighter. Mm -hmm. Being a New York City firefighter, becoming one of the bravest um, in this country, is one of the best jobs that anyone can have. And I know that you have uh, the number, but the number uh, to find out more about becoming a New York City firefighter is 718-999-FDNY. Call and ask, how do I become a firefighter? What are the requirements needed for me to join the FDNY? But we're also looking for EMTs and paramedics. And you can use the same number the call to find out how I can become an EMT, how I can become a paramedic. As you know, EMTs and paramedics are the re first medical responders on the scene of an incident to try mm -hmm. to save your life and try to get you to the hospital and, and, and to take care of you. The firefighters come in, they rescue you from the fire, 
they get you to the EMTs, to the paramedics, and it's a all hands on deck family well, to save well, lives. Jim, you know, I have been uh, aware, many people have, about your your abilities, not only with the fire department, but with the MTA and the city and state of New York to focus on hiring um, black and brown uh, individuals, women, uh, who, when we started working together in 19... I don't want to go back to the dates. <laughs> a lot of the stuff that is happening now, especially in the fire department, more so perhaps even the, the, the police department. And I and I say that is because my nephew um, uh, is now a firefighter. And uh, he, uh, I think it's the Falcons, I believe. The, the Vulcan Society. The Vulcans, yeah. You know, uh, I introduced him. Uh, to that organization because I, it seemed like he was getting the runaround and and you know with certain types of applications because he his situation was different he was too smart <laughs> they were told him, you know he he so so I I thought that that was an interesting you you always hear about these uh, people who are not able to do well on the test but then. If you do too well on the test, you <laughs> you also have an, an issue. But the Falcons, and and I think that there are uh, other organizations. But I do know uh, the Falcons. Well, in the fire department, the black firefighters, uh, men and women, are right. members of the Vulcan Society. But Vulcans, I'll tell you one yeah. thing about the Vulcan Society: uh, they have the first female president of the Vulcan Society, a no firefighter kidding. named Regina Wilson, and. Wow. Uh, you know, she leads that organization and, uh, you know, she's done an excellent job in, in increasing the membership, getting people to join the Vulcans. I mean, everybody that looks like you and I, Tony, there's no reason why they should not be a member of the Vulcan Society. At you one know, point, um, I would like to interview her. You know, um, people should know more about that. I, as you know, um, Chief Wesley Williams. Right. Was, Going back. Uh, we, you know, Lloyd and I used to hang out in Lloyd Dickens' office many, many years ago when he was the president of the Uptown Chamber of Commerce. And Chief Wesley Williams uh, would give us uh, conversations uh, about the stuff that he went through. He was one of the first black firefighters and he had to fight every day and he had until he started saving people's lives and then they wanted him to. Well, there, as you know, there was a lot of discrimination going back in the beginning and times have gotten better, but you know, we still have a long way to go, but that's why it's important that we keep bringing people that look like you and I into the ranks of the New York City Fire Department. That's why I gave you the number, uh, 1718-999-FDNY. Find out what you need to do to become a firefighter. Uh, we should be in our communities, educating our communities on the destruction uh, that fire can do. When you do become the firefighter, make sure you join the Vulcan Society. But let me just give you a little information. You talked about Wesley Williams. You and I went on 135th Street when they had the uh, uh, monument dedication of Wesley Williams by the mm -hmm. YMCA right. uh, many, many years ago. But in addition to that, the first black fire commission is Robert Lowry. Robert Lowry got appointed by John Lindsay in the mid 60s to become uh, the first black firefighter because of the fires that were taking place and the destruction that was taking place in the 60s. Bob Lowry was one of the founders of the Vulcan Society for Black Firefighters. And, um, you know, we've had two black fire commissioners, Bob Lowry and, and Augustus Beekman. Um, you know, you know, so we have a long way to go. We're still trying to do a lot of things. But, you know, if you do become a firefighter, a black firefighter, you need to make sure you join the Vulcans. And I mean, uh, the Vulcan Society is where you should be. You know, in the police department, you had the Guardians Association. So mm -hmm. there was over, always a rivalry between the Guardians and the Vulcans. They used we to have football the games and, and, and basketball games. Yeah, too. football, basketball game, picnics together. But let me just say this, that, you know, if you become a firefighter, you don't want to stop at just being a firefighter. You want to become a lieutenant, a captain, a battalion chief, a deputy chief. And then you want to look to get appointed to those ranks above that. And someday 
hoping to become the next fire commissioner of the city of New York. I mean, these are dreams that we should all have. But we need to get in the department. We need to move up the career ladder. And we need to uh, uh, take charge. And we need to go back into our communities and say, listen, I made it. You can make it. And that's very important. Uh, teamwork pays off. Well, again, uh, Jim, you uh, are a person that actually represents the opportunity that can take place by being able to uh, be there and taking advantage of uh, those types of opportunities, being in the right place at the right, at, at the right time. Uh, when you uh, worked with uh, the governor's office, uh, I, I guess I put it the, uh, another way: What was the most more challenging, working with the governor's office as a close connection to uh, advance and 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 security, or working in the mayor's office? Well, let me just say this. In the mayor's office, um, you know, I had a great opportunity to work for Ed Koch. I think Ed Koch was one of the greatest mayors the city's ever had. And uh, he afforded me a lot of opportunity when his office. Uh, you may remember, Tony, I became the first black and the youngest person in the history of New York at the time to ever become a deputy fire commissioner of this department. Mm -hmm. I stayed there about 18, 19 months, but the mayor wanted me back at City Hall because he recognized my talent. I got appointed as special advisor uh, to the mayor. During that tenure, there was a young police officer named Ed Byrne that was assassinated in Southeast Queens while guarding a drug in his house. This was 1988. After that, the mayor named the police commissioner and myself, the police commissioner was Ben Ward, his co-chair of TNT, which was the tactical narcotics team, a program to eradicate drugs throughout New York City. The reason why I was named co-chair with the police commissioner was because the police commissioner couldn't tell other city agencies what to do. I could. And I had a task force of 25 city agencies with a deputy commissioner of those agencies, which also included housing police, transit police, that reported directly to me. So I had a great time working with Ed Koch. Um, you know, it was some of the best time in my year. And I never thought leaving that, that I would have another opportunity to work with somebody. But in 1995, George Pataki brought me on board. And George Pataki was just as great, even though one was a Democrat, one was a Republican, was just as great as working for Ed Koch. Um, George Pataki made me the chair of the New York State Martin Luther King Holiday Commission. And in 2006, I was nominated for an Emmy Award for Best Public Broadcasting because every year, uh, New York State did a Martin Luther King holiday program up in the state capitol, which was broadcast throughout the state, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And unfortunately, I didn't get the Emmy Award. I lost out to the Christmas tree lighting in Rockefeller Center, but they had a lot more money, so I can understand that. But, but you know, I had a great time working for both these individuals. And, you know, it didn't matter Democrat or Republican. It was the individual that mm. made a difference. It was working for the individual. And I really enjoyed working for Ed Koch as well as I did for George Pataki. They and were both great leaders throughout this state. Now, Tony, before you ask the question, I was also very involved in 9-11. Yeah, I, I was, was, I was going to just talk about that. Yeah, yeah I was in charge of uh, the governor's uh, response 9-11. Um, I was down there quite often. As a matter of fact, I was trapped down there the day of the event for a short time. It seemed like an eternity, but I was down there dealing with family issues, trying to get things under control for a long time in the aftermath of 9-11. And, you know, um, George Pataki did a phenomenal job as governor and um, running the state. And, you know, he was a three-term governor. Ed Koch was a three-term mayor. And I was there for the 12 years for both those individuals. <laughs> and it was George Pataki that appointed me commissioner, member of the MTA Board of Directors. Well, you know, again, having that type of time frame also allowed for you to do so many things within the community. I know because uh, in Harlem Week, you were always there doing something and braining uh, whatever, whether it was the mayor's office or the governor's office or the MTA uh, into the fold in order to make things happen. Matter of fact, many people have an award on their walls 
that was designed by the MTA. You started that and it has continued. But those are those are the awards that many people who receive Hollow Week awards, for whatever, uh, we use the MTA posters because they were always, you know, everybody would wonder what's the poster gonna be like this year? Because you guys did such a wonderful job and you started that. Uh, among other things that uh, uh, we have been going through for, for many years. When you talk about 39 years or 50 years, there's so much stuff that we probably have forgotten that people <laughs> don't even know that we were involved in. <laughs> we were involved in quite a bit, but we did a good job. And, you know, if you use the expression, when the team won, we definitely won Tony for the Harlem community and all the <laughs> things that we did. But, you know, I just wanted to share this with you. When I left government in 2015, I went in and I became an adjunct professor in CUNY. I was at City College, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and Mega Evers, where I was able to use my experience to give something back to the community. And that was very fruitful for me. Um, in addition to that, you know, it was a great opportunity to be able to work with Rosalind Carter traveling around the United States as part of advanced staff. So I had an opportunity to learn a lot of things. But Eric Adams, you know, is our second black mayor. And um, I'm a big supporter of Eric. And I was asked to come back to take this position as an assistant fire commissioner. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that the mayor asked me to come back to be able to once again help the people of the city of New York. And that's been my priority, whether I'm teaching or whether I was with Ed Koch, George Pataki, or with the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. It's all about the people of the city, helping them and maintaining the quality of life for people. Well, Jim, again, when uh, your name comes up, there are so many different lives that you have uh, helped uh, it just depends on where you were at the particular time and who the person was that was able to receive the benefit of you being there. And uh, I, I know as my personal understanding is that I've always uh, appreciated you being able to be the same person. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when you are in certain circles and you're uh, 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 dealing with certain things, there's a tendency to let that go to your head. <laughs> but you've always I been the same that. guy, you Thank know? You. <laughs> you would do all of these things, but it was always the same gym, which I really appreciate. Well, I appreciate that, Tony. And like I said, it's all about the future of our community. And I think that, you know, we're not minorities anymore. We're the majority. And we have to come together as one to make sure that everyone understands that we're the majority. You know, one of the things that, and, and I know you know, uh, that saddened me was uh, during 9-11, uh, Rudy Giuliani really kind of came into his own and was, uh, I guess, the right place at the right time because uh, for many people say if it wasn't for 9 11, he would have had a problem because of his ratings. But he uh, he did an interesting job. And, and, uh, and here lately, it's just kind of sad to see what he will be remembered by rather than the work that he was able to do for New York City for that period of time. Uh, and I know I say that because I know that you were there and you saw all of the stuff that took place, especially in 9-11, when the world was in chaos because America was in chaos. And uh, uh, he was that person uh, who uh, represented New York City. And uh, he lived up to that, to that, to that name. Uh, and, and, and it's so sad sometimes to, to understand that he won't be remembered for that. He'll be remembered for some of the things that have taken place recently. Well, we have a good team and there's a lot for us to remember. I mean, you know, we go back to Dave Dinkins and we go to Eric Adams and we go to Ed Koch and, you know, we go to a lot of the mayors, but you're right, uh, Rudy Giuliani was the mayor uh, during 9-11 and he was considered to be America's mayor uh, because of that. He got that title and everywhere he went, 
we got the respect and admiration of being America's mayor. But because of circumstances moving fast and forth beyond that, um, there were consequences that unfortunately became out of control. And like you said, it's, it's sad, it's unfortunate. But what's unfortunate though, is we still continue to do the good work in Harlem. And mm -hmm. we still continue to make sure that this community is recognized as one of the best communities, not only in the city, state, or nation, but the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's what Harlem is about. And through Lloyd Williams and yourself, uh, Tony Rogers, <laughs> you know, I mean, we go back well, 40 years, I mean, over 40 years. And I mean, you know, you and I are still here, and that's one of the good things. And and we look almost almost as good as we looked then. But, you know, my hair has gotten a little thin. I well, mean, the mat is gone, you know. Yeah, it's, a little, it's a little discolored now, and, you know, but, you know, but we're still here, and we'll still be able to reminisce and talk about where we started, where we've come from, but most definitely, Tony, where we're going. But I want to congratulate you on this show. I want to congratulate you for the hard work and everything that you've done for uh, the community. I want to thank you for allowing me to come on today and talk about fire safety and talk about a few things. And one of the things before I, I let you go, Jim, could you give the information about uh, how young people might be able to get uh, involved in, in, in the fire department? Well, I want everybody to go uh, 1718 FDNY. I want you to call. I want you to see two things. I want you to see how you can become an EMT uh, and how you can become a firefighter. I think our young people uh, need that uh, as an inspiration. And there are also a number of groups going around. I don't know if you've ever heard of TAG, which is Teaching a Generation. Uh, mm -hmm. which the Coens run, uh, they bring young kids in to look at programs to benefit them, to get them off the street, give a uh, younger generation an idea and an opportunity to see what's ahead of them for their future. And, and you know, stay in school. Give it your best shot. You don't have to be an A student. You don't have to be a B student. But you have to stay at a minimum of a C, C student. But give it your best shot. Don't give up. Because you're going to get there, but you got to work hard, and it'll pay off. And you know, one of the other things, uh, both with the police department and the fire department, there are so many different types of career paths within those organizations that a lot of times you don't hear about. I mean, if you, if the police department is the detective and the and mm -hmm. walking the beat, and the fire department is putting out fires, but there are so many other opportunities, uh, exciting opportunities, you know, uh, you know, in, in the different branches that a lot of people never uh, uh, know about. And I always wondered why in uh, the promotion of uh, or recruitment that some of these uh, different types of um, opportunities, career path opportunities within the fire department and within the police department that uh, have a direct or indirect relationship with enforcement or firefighting, but uh, they're, they're not um, talked about as, as much, except for when you go to certain workshops and, 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 and other things. And a lot of people, I would think, and you are the person that I'm, I could ask this question to, I would think that if in recruiting other types of uh, career path opportunities were talked about, it might be a lot more encouraging. What do you think about that? No, I think you're absolutely right, but we all need to teach a younger generation the opportunities that exist for them. I think being a police officer, being a firefighter are great opportunities. You know, what the younger generation needs to know, not everybody is gonna be Jay-Z or Beyonce, and that there are career paths for you uh, to get on the right track, to be able to uh, have affordable living, to raise your family, to have your children, to educate them, and to move them forward in life. I mean, you know, there's just so much we can do, but also another career path in the fire department, you have fire prevention inspectors. Those are the individuals that actually go out and do inspectors. There are opportunities for those jobs. I mean, I think I gave you the DCAS website where you can go to yes. uh, DCAS and you can look for 
jobs within the fire department. It tells about exams and dates, and, and you can start preparing. I know the Vulcan Society uh, prepares young men and women uh, to become firefighters. Um, you know, and you, like I said, you have the first female president of the Vulcan Society in its history mm-hmm. um, you leading that. And, you know, we want to make sure that we get more women firefighters, more women and men at ZMTs. And, and we just want to keep increasing the numbers, um, you know, and, and it's, it's hard work, Tony, trying to increase the numbers. But through programs like yours, giving people an opportunity to see what's there, you know, will afford them a great opportunity. I, you know, I, I, I say this again. I, I have talked with you. I would like to be able at some point in the, in the near future is to interview uh, the new uh uh, female president of, of the Vulcans. I, I think that that's very important for especially young women to understand that they're, they're, there's room and positions that may be uh, uh, available that perhaps had not come into the mindset. She should be out there a little bit more. Hopefully we can help do that. Well, yeah, hopefully you can. And you know what, Tony? I'm committing to you right now. I will reach out to her. We'll make it happen. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate that. And and one of the things that uh, I got of Texas, uh, even though you're not with the MTA, do you have any idea of what the design of the 50th anniversary MTA post is? That's always the most guarded secret. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know it yet, but you know, I started those posters uh, with the MTA and and, and, you know, the creation was done by the chamber and, and the MTA. And, and those posters, people love those posters. Those posters were items. a really big, big hit. And, you know, they were actually given away as, as gifts uh, for people that made contributions to the various communities, whether they were sponsors or Harlem Week or people that did outstanding things for the Harlem community. So I don't know what it's going to be yet, but I will find out at some point. And uh, you know, I'll let you know. <laughs> that's that's a closely guarded, guarded, guarded secret. Yeah. I, I, uh, it, it's been again, a big thing. Uh, and it's been and it's been helpful. Uh, you have been uh, again one of those individuals that I'm so glad that uh, vehicles like Soul City gives an opportunity to um, to record some of this information years from now when people are talking about the second Harlem Renaissance like they're talking about the the first Harlem Renaissance. The difference is that this time they will be able to see the Jim Hardings and the and the Lord Williams and the Charlie Wrangles and all of the, the individuals that have been um, part of that second Harlem Renaissance development. So uh, I am happy to have recorded uh, you, Jim, so that people, um, after we or just memories will be able to see us and know that a lot of the stuff that they're taking advantage of, uh, you are the pioneer in making happen, especially with the MTA and, and, the, and the New York City Fire Department. So thank you, my friend. Well, thank you. I've had a great career and I'm just glad that I'm able to get something back. And like you said, after we become memories, not too soon, I hope, but after we become <laughs> memories, somebody can look back at these Uh, tapes, and they can say, wow, I wish I had known these two individuals. (laughs) Well, uh, again, uh, there's been a blessing to be, you know, we always talk about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, For the last 50 years, uh, the blessing, as I reflect back on it, is that every third Sunday in August for the last at least 49 years and soon to be 50 years, God willing, but at least 49 years, I knew what I was doing. I, you know, I knew, I, I, it's, it's very seldom that you could go for 49 years and look at a certain date, except for your birthday. And you right. probably, I don't even know what I was doing at certain birthdays that I've had for the last 50 years. But I do know that for a fact that I was doing something about Harlem and Harlem Day for that time period. So that in and of itself, uh, I guess you can consider that a legacy, but uh, the people who were on that journey like yourself, 
I'm just so happy to be able to provide uh, a platform thanks to Soul City and and many of the other WACR and Harlem Community News, uh, the media, which which is is important for us to do that. Even and with the mayor, I, I mentioned to you, um, I'm talking with the mayor's office uh, for him to come come on uh, because it's our responsibility, the black media, you know, to to help ourselves. Any other uh, entity uh, will do what they do in order to help those who they want to support. And I think it's important for us to be able to use what we have to, to get what we need. And that's, uh, you know, people like yourself. So thank you um, well, I appreciate uh, Jim, it, for taking time to be on the show. And uh, we look forward to, and if there's any special programs or anything that uh, you or the commissioner will be uh, interested in getting the word out, please let us know and we'll make sure that we do that, okay? Most definitely. And Tony, I'd just like to add this before you go. I wish we were around for the next 50 years because I'd like to see where we are then. So, uh, but that's not, it's not likely. <laughs> but, but, but you never know. You never know. You know. Well, again, uh, thanks, Jim Harding Jr. Uh, Dr. Jim Harding Jr. Oh, wow. <laughs> You, Lloyd, and 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 a few others. Uh, uh, and Lloyd runs away from it. You know, <laughs> I've been called. I've been called a lot of things, Tony. But, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I appreciate you, and I appreciate what you're doing. Soul City is monumental to our. It's community. the first uh, fully black-owned streaming t- oh. television network. Congratulations to Matt and Jazz and yourself yeah. and everybody here. But I just want to add one comment before you do. Sure. We have a great mayor in Eric Adams, and it's just very important that we all make sure that we continue to support him. He's got a rough job, and he needs our support, and we want to make sure that he stays as mayor of this great city. Well, uh, again, uh, even though we like to think it, racism is not dead completely yet. No, it's not. <laughs> so, so no matter where we are, um, we're always going to get looked upon a little differently. Mm-hmm. And if there's any type of slip, it will be, uh, which is what I always said about Obama, God, what pressure that he had to go mm-hmm. under because the least little thing would have been exploded more so than, right. than not. I, you know, uh, not to be political, but if Obama had done uh, 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 a quarter of the stuff that Trump had done. Can you imagine what, what, what would have happened? Uh, but yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> or maybe we can imagine because yeah, they probably can. would have thought about something else. To, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, I, yeah, we can we can imagine. Yeah, yeah, certain <laughs> things have not changed, Tony. Well, uh, with the help of people like you, though, we have been able to, in many cases, overcome a lot. And and thank you for your service. Uh, no, thank to, you, Tony, to, for yours. To New York City and New York State and your continued service. Matter of fact, I, I was surprised because at one point I, you said, well, I'm I'm going to retire now and, 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 and go on a beach someplace. And then the next thing I know, I said, what? <laughs> you're back. Well, could, assistant commissioner, you, you, you're back. But uh, sometimes it's in your blood. And I think well, it's, it's hard to keep good men down, especially when <laughs> I look at it as an opportunity. Everything I do, I'm doing it for the future generation. It's not for Jim Harding. It's for the future generation of this city and our community. And that's what it's about. Well, that's good. And you're following in your, your, your fat. You have a family tradition also. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure that that's an important thing to, to feel good about. Yeah, Tony, thank you so much for your time. Take care and give me the uh, opportunity to be here. And, and we'll be seeing each other soon, I'm sure, based on uh, coming definitely. into summer. You know what that means. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were on the call last week, so we are getting together soon. That's true. Uh, you know, every as every third Thursday, I believe, there is a call that came up based on uh, a need to communicate from the uh, COVID issue with the various leaders and commissioners and elected officials that my good friend Lloyd Williams has put together and maintained because people said, well, that's a good idea. Let's, let's, let's keep that going. And 
And it is because in listening to some of the things you talked about motivated me to try to get you to come on and talk about some things. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. But just hey. before you go, remind your audience again, if you don't have a working smoke detector, if you need a smoke detector, you can call 1-800-877-2767. And that's through the Red Cross. And that's through a program through the New York City Fire Foundation, Red Cross, which was and I, I think that I, and and with the fire detectors, it's almost like you know in fall and spring. You know when you turn your clock your, your clock up for fall and you turn it no down f fall back spring forward. The same thing with your detector. You need to check it. You yeah. know. Yeah. Well, the the New York City Fire Department has initiated this with the Fire Foundation and the Red Cross. You can get a free smoke detector. They will actually come out and install it for you. And, you know, 40 years ago, they didn't do that. Well, and, uh, I, and, I, and I know that uh, it takes people like you to be able to be in the right positions to support certain types of movements. So thank you, Jim. And we appreciate you. So Looking forward to working with you uh, this year. And as long as you decide not to retire, I do <laughs> <laughs> take care. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, Matt. And thank you, Jazz. And uh, uh, again, this is uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to begin to talk to to a lot of uh, the people who uh, over the 50 years of Holloway played important roles. And one of the things that uh, I, I will attempt to do is to try to start bringing uh, people on who were there at that time who were uh, part of uh, the second hollow renaissance. And um, we will, uh, thanks to Soul City and, and other vehicles, we will kind of keep you informed. There are a lot of things that are going to happen this year, a lot of developments. Uh, the, uh, and we talk about GoHollam.org, uh, the Harlem tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, is exploding. Uh, it, uh, we have a new hotel, we have a new civic museum, uh, uh, a new studio museum, Black, uh, 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 and it will, uh, National Black Theater will, will be developed. So there's a lot of things that are happening, a lot of job opportunities too. Uh, a lot of members of the Harlem Tourism Board will start to look for. We have a, a, a grant that we're looking through through the city council to train tour operators, to get them licensed to become tour guides, as well as uh, the GoHollam.org to begin to create a way for students through Columbia University, City College, and Silicon Harlem to help create uh, a state-of-the-art uh, Harlem Tourism Board website that people will go to and uh, to create a way where if you want to find out what's going on in Harlem, you uh, go to goharlem.org and uh, the events, the restaurants, the hotels, and the different things will be listed. So there's a lot to do. And again, thank you, uh, Matt McCoy, Jasmine, for uh, giving this platform and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, again next week. Take care. This is Kia Rogers, and you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers, on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. Cheers.